redefining creative, us and the me generation. A generation born to say, text me instead of call me, Facebook me instead of write to me, where you don't actually have to go and see performance anymore, you can just YouTube it, right? You don't actually have to pay for the music that the person made for you. You can just download it, torrent it, Spotify it, Bandcamp it, whatever. And 20 years ago, when someone was eating their food, they would have no idea what would be happening in the rest of the world, and they could care less. Now, before you even get a chance to eat your meal, you know exactly what's happening on the other side of the world, and you feel the suffering of another human being that you've never even met into a place you've never even been to. Now we live in a time where answers, questions are abundant. Questions come at a touch of a button. And we are living in the most hyper-connected, hyper-empathetic times in human civilization. We're literally on, on the brink of the next stage in human evolution. But why are we more disconnected than ever before? Why do we hide behind these false realities we set up for ourselves online? Instead of actually going out into the world, engaging with it, and finding a part of yourself that you never thought was there. Now, when you feel sad, depressed, lonely, anxious, you can't sit still, you can't answer properly, they have a pill for that. They have a pill for all of that, legal or illegal. There's something to cure it. Because we live in this very self-gratifying type of society where we need the answers right now. We need the cure right now. And the problem is, that's not the cure. And there never will be. The sense of displacement that we all feel in life is something that can never be cured. And maybe it's the way life is telling us that we've got a lot of work to figure out where we're going to go in life. And see, I've always felt displaced. I've always felt like I really never fit in. I never really made the grades. I wasn't what you would call SAT smart. And I'm pretty sure I failed all my AP classes. And I hated math. Math was a nightmare. But see, the thing was, I was never praised for daydreaming or drawing on my tests. Instead, I felt discouraged. I felt discouraged that I wouldn't fit into the mold that society intended for me. Because the thing is, we, there's that same old tale that we all know, where you grow up, go to school, go to more school, graduate, go to more school, graduate again, land a job you hopefully like, find a career that hopefully you're good at, pay off those student loans that are racking up, meet someone, have a kid, and die. I don't want to be that morbid, but in all that, that's how I felt like <laughs> growing up. But in all that chaos, I felt something and I found something that made sense to me and me alone. I had music, I had the arts. So back in high school, I made this band. Uh, we're called Mouthful of Snow. We were kind of like a pop, alternative, experimental, genre, whatever it was. The genres didn't matter because the genre classification wasn't important. It was about making something for myself and communicating with other people. And in that communication, you would get that response that, I get it. I know how it feels to be lonely and anxious as well. And actually, that, this, first, this was actually my first show ever. That was me with the beautiful long locks over there playing the Telecaster. It was at this place called Java Joe's back in the day, and they had this open mic night that we got to play. And if it wasn't for that show, if it wasn't for that response that people said, I, I get it, I don't think I would keep playing music. But even in all that, I felt a lot of scrutiny. A lot of people saying I didn't sing properly, I didn't play properly, we weren't radio friendly, I don't think we dressed cool enough. And why was that? When you have media outlets such as American Idol, you have the X Factor, you have the, the voice, whatever it is, telling us and judging us what's right or wrong, good or bad, boxing the, the, the very notion of creative and bordering it and making people fearful of it. When it's not about right or wrong, good or bad, it's about creating something for yourself and that individual journey that you have. And in all of that, I came up with a very simple notion about wanting to just play and, and express art. Because I saw people like my younger brother. He was a very talented kid. And it was very heartbreaking for me to hear things that happen here in suburbia. I mean, I've, I've lived in suburbia my whole life, and it's great. It's safe. I don't have to worry about my car getting stolen. It's fantastic. But there seems to be the same troubling notion that everybody under 21 has, which is, there's nothing to do here. 
I heard that over and over again, and to me, I thought it was crazy because back in the day, we always got, had a place to play. We had you know, people to support. We had a place to belong to. And so after all of that, there was this notion that started brewing, this thing called DIY. It stands for do it yourself. And this struck a nerve with people my age and everybody around me because it was about taking something that was ours already and bringing it back to other people. It was about using our own devices to make anything and everything happen, whether it was recording music or publishing your own zine or making your own shows. And it was, we put shows anywhere. I mean, in, in a backyard, in a living room, uh, under a bridge, uh, in a basement, in a warehouse, wherever it was, we could make it happen. And there was this very profound ph philosopher that struck a nerve with me. Uh, his name was Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was a famous transcendentalist philosopher back in the 1800s. And him and his friends who of other, um, of other skills uh, would, put, would publish this, this type of zine to other people to invoke self-thought. And the, what it was called was dial. So I wanted to make a place for other people to and invoke self-thought with a very simple notion of having a safe space, having a place where people can feel inspired and connected, and using our own individual resources to making anything we wanted happen. And it was really an experiment for me to see if people cared enough. And we had very simple rules. We had no drugs, no drinking, respect the spot. And to most of you, that might seem like common sense, but to a lot of people, they don't understand that. They don't understand that coming to a space and to take care of it, you're gonna have to take responsibility for yourself and other people around you. So in this experiment, I wanted to see if people cared. First, we had like a small uh, room, no bigger than this. It was probably like a third of this room. And it was just a hallway. And we would throw open mic nights, we would have poetry readings, we would have comedy nights, we would have gallery nights, where anybody in whatever medium of art you had, you had a place to showcase it. This is that room that we had, no bigger than anything here. And that's my little brother playing his first show at one of our open mic nights. And I've seen a lot of beautiful people play their first shows there and, and find that inspiration within them to keep going. And that really struck a nerve with me as well to know that people did care. Too many people cared. Too many people came in. It was too much. We didn't have enough space. And we're a nonprofit, so we had no money. We run month by month on donations. And that every month we figure out people care. They care enough to give us money to keep going. Because everybody there doesn't make a buck out of this. We're there to volunteer our time. And one time, the, I think at this particular event, uh, we had five cops come in there with like six, it was like six cop cars. And they were rushing in trying to figure out what kind of, what was happening, what kind of terrible things we were doing to the community. We had a bake sale. We had a bake sale, we had a benefit show, we had an open mic, and I talked to them like human beings, and I said, hey, this is what's happening, this is a safe space, blah, blah, blah. And you know what happened? They let us keep going, because we worked with the community, we engaged with it, and that's what we teach everybody that works there, is that they engage and work and build a relationship to be able to have something for yourself. And this is the other hallway that we have, where we got too big, so we ended up getting the warehouse next door, and that just kept showing me, like, people keep caring. And we also allowed graffiti artists and artists to draw whatever you want on the walls, because it's your space, not mine. And the big, and we, we would try to teach people also that if you want things to change, then you have to stand up and change it. This is your scene. Stand up, speak up, help build a community, support local and touring acts, and make people realize that the people performing in front of you came from another state and they're broke as well. And knowing that you're paying your money to help them get to another place gives meaning behind what you do. But we got in trouble. We, we racked up too many complaints and things just got to a point where we got closed down for a month. We had no insurance, we didn't have all the proper things, so we had to raise all this money. And for me, that was very hard because I felt like I was already asking for too much for people to donate money and keep us open. Now I have to ask for a thousand or more dollars? Well, we asked for a thousand. We got 2,600. We actually got 3,500 because people all over the world donated to us. People who've never even been there. And I thought that was amazing to see that. And then I had another friend who came in, a good friend of mine named Spencer from Springfield, Missouri. He saw the space, he played with his band, they were touring through there, and he was just so awe-inspired by it. And he said his community needed this. So what I would do, I just told him the simple notions, was 
create a safe space for people to feel inspired and supported. So he did. Well, actually, that's me and my friends. It's all the great people I've met doing it. But then he opened up his own space. Now his community has something for themselves. They can throw their own shows, they can publish their own zines, and they can affect other people within. But I wanted to change that notion of do it yourself, because it wasn't about me, it was a bigger and a larger community that was growing. So I wanted to redefine that and call, and call it DIT, which is do it together. So other friends of mine who, who also helped us raise money at their spaces made me realize that when one space falls, another one is crippled, and how we're so interconnected in this society. So I wanted to have another experiment. I wanted to see if, you know, if these other spaces care so much, let's sit down and talk. Because when, to change, it comes with large numbers. And I wanted to mobilize those great numbers together and see what could come out of it. And this is the first meeting that ever happened in Southern California where all these different spaces from the Che Cafe from the San Diego to Bridgetown DIY to a space called LA Fort from LA, almost Holden from Santa Monica, some places for all the way up in SLO, came together to meet and talk and discuss what we were doing and, and teach each other what things we could fix, help each other find and engage our communities and build something bigger than ourselves. And I met wonderful people throughout that experience too. So I had this, this another experiment that I want to try. What if we had these spaces all over the world? And what if we connected all the spaces and all those spaces engaged their communities and gave people the opportunity and chance to make something for themselves? I mean, could real world change happen then? I don't know, but it's something that I really want to try and hope that people can still support us and help us. Because it takes one note to discourage that creative force within someone. And it takes a whole community to really suppress that thing we all have within all of us. But it takes one yes to inspire an individual. And it takes one whole community to inspire a generation. Thank you.